Kevin, Marjorie, this is just wonderful that, that we are gathered again tonight to hear more about the unrelenting love of God. Well, welcome to uh, another Super Wednesday teaching. Tonight is on the greatest love story. There, I'm sharing my screen now. And so before we do begin, let us, let us enter prayer. Uh, Father, we are so thankful that you do call your people together, that as believers and disciples who follow Jesus, we are called to uh, come together, that we assemble as the faithful, that we seek to know more of you. And so we ask that you bless this time tonight, draw us ever more closer to the foot of the cross, would you reveal more of your word, instill within us a hunger to be in the word. And we ask all this by the power of the Holy Spirit in your son's precious name, Jesus. Amen. Well, tonight, can I get a thumbs up? Can you see my screen? Am I sharing? Good. Well, tonight, this is the greatest love story ever written. And again, good evening and thank you for being with us. You know, these teachings from Alpha to Omega, um, they're going to go on. Uh, we'll have another teaser tonight. Uh, next week, the Reverend David Booman will, be, uh, will be teaching. But tonight, we're going to talk about our Bible. And I want us to really dig into the nature of Scripture and how it's interpreted. And I want to begin by using the analogy that I first heard from Douglas O'Connolly, who said, suppose you find a letter blowing around on the street tomorrow morning. It probably won't mean a lot to you, but if you were told that the letter was written by a man to a friend or by a woman to her daughter, suddenly the letter takes on more significance. If you then discover that the man's friend is dying or that the woman's daughter is a runaway, the words may move you powerfully. Sometimes what will open your understanding to a section of the Bible is just knowing who wrote it and who first read it. Just a few words explaining what it's all about can make the Bible come alive. I love that little quote. See, you'll find just about every kind of writing in the Bible. Love letters, songs, historical records, diaries, visions of the future, genealogies. And as you may know, the Bible was the first book printed on a printing press. Johannes Gutenberg, who started experimenting with printing around 1438, in the town of Mainz, Germany, whose masterpiece and the first book ever printed is known as the 42-line Bible, completed around 1455. And by the way, having lived in Germany for about three years, I had a chance to visit the Gutenberg Museum, which is located just opposite the cathedral in the old part of Mainz. And it's a must-see if you're in that part of the world. But I wanna share with you another story that is told of Sir Walter Scott, the Scottish his historical novelist and playwright, known for such works as The Lady of the Lake, Rob Roy, and Ivanhoe, to name a few. And this is a story when he was terminally ill. He asked a friend to read from the book. And since Scott had a large library, the friend asked, which one? And Scott replied, there is but one book the Bible. The Bible is a unique book. The name comes from the Greek word, biblos, meaning book. And there's another Greek word that is also used, and it's biblia, meaning little books. See, the Protestant Bible contains 66 little books, 39 within the Old Testament and 27 within the New Testament. And these books were written over a period spanning some 1,600 years by persons ranging all the way from kings to poets to prophets to a physician to uh, farmers and shepherds to fishermen and to a, a tax collector 
to apostles, to a pastor and other spiritual leaders. And not a one of them knew that their writings would become scripture for the Holy Bible. The early church leaders, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, they discerned which of these writings, these letters, were God-inspired. These writings became our biblical canon. Canon comes from another Greek word, meaning rule, recognized by the church as authoritative writings. Scripture. Since 397 AD, as affirmed at the Council of Carthage, the Christian church has considered the canon of the Bible to be complete. The canon of both the Old and New Testaments, it tells a complete story. And when understood, no book contradicts the other. Its nature is founded in its self-authentication. Scripture derives its authority from God, not man. All scripture is God breathed, as we're told in 2 Timothy. As my professor, the Reverend Dr. Robert J. Sanders states, the authors of scripture were inspired by God, and it is God, the Holy Spirit, who reveals his word and words to us today. Our attitude towards scripture, therefore, needs to be one of prayer and humility. As we seek to know scripture, it's important that we do so from the framework and understanding of our creeds and from eight interpretive principles. So here, I want us to look at our creeds to see the importance of these proclamations of our faith that are derived from Holy Scripture, the Nicene Creed and the Apostles' Creed. They're received and believed, and they provide the framework for all three persons of the Trinity who are always present when one is at work. See, the creeds provide a lens for interpreting any passage of Scripture within the whole work of one triune God. All three, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are involved in each of God's words, actions, and appearances throughout the whole narrative, beginning with creation centered on Jesus and with his coming kingdom. This is fully reflected in the construct of the Nicene Creed where we affirm our belief in one God, the Father, maker of heaven and earth, of one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, through whom all things were made, and in the Holy Spirit, the giver of life. And it ends with our anticipation of the life of the world to come. And the Apostles' Creed has a similar threefold construct affirming the Trinity. See, the creeds, they, they reflect God's word. And it's the biblical pattern beginning with creation centered on the revelation in Jesus Christ and ending with our blessed hope in the resurrection and life everlasting. And here's the cool thing about our creeds. And that is all interpretation is within this framework that works in conjunction with these eight interpretive principles the first being in scripture, when God speaks, acts, or appears, he does so as one God who speaks in a threefold way as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So what I plan to do is to quickly touch on these eight, and then I'll circle back to the Bible's message, that love story for us today. So let's jump right in. The first principle of recognizing the Trinity when God speaks, acts, or appears helps in our understanding of revelation, his revealing redemption for all creation. If we could never know God unless he takes the initiative, see, we could never know him unless he takes the initiative to make himself known. Throughout scripture, the word reveals the Father's his unfolding plan of redemption, 
And it's only through Christ can we come to, and only through Christ can we know the Father. After the ascension of Jesus Christ, revelation continues within the church by the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus tells us that he has more to say than we can bear. He tells us that more truth will be given by the Holy Spirit after he is with the Father. The work of the Holy Spirit continues in personal revelation. It continues in our hearing God's purpose for our lives as we live in this world to influence it by his call and by his direction. As uh, another one of my professors, Sanders, states, in all revelation we find the Trinity, the Father's message given to us in Jesus and recognized and discerned by the power of the Holy Spirit. The second principle is this, to interpret any passage in light of the whole biblical narrative, beginning with creation, centered on Jesus Christ, and with the life of the world to come. See, this principle leads, leads us to have emphasis on our understanding of the sufficiency of Scripture for salvation. And John stopped. He draws attention to this in his book, Evangelical Truth, stating, Sola Scriptura. It's another Reformation concern for believers to understand that our Bible contains all things necessary to salvation. And our third interpretive principle is interpreting all scripture in reference to Jesus Christ as revealed in the gospel. I'm going to jump to another one of my favorites, and that's Bishop John Rogers. And he states, canonical scripture, collectively, the Old and New Testaments provide a coherent statement of faith in the light of Christ. Interpreting scripture through the lens of Jesus Christ must correctly reference the Jesus as revealed in the Gospels. Jesus is the center of all Scripture. The relationship between the Old Testament, its revelation, and the New Testament, and its revelation is given in Jesus Christ. He is the fulfillment of the law and of the prophets, and knowledge of him is found in the Gospels that witness directly to him. It is by him that scripture has authority over us. Because scripture is the revelation of God by the inspiration of the spirit, it has authority over us. It is through the son that the father is revealed. The authority of scripture carries with it the authority of Christ. And when interpreting scripture through the lens of Jesus, we also look at the context of its historical circumstances, which leads us to the fourth guiding principle. And that is that the original meaning of any passage of scripture depends upon the meaning of its words and the context of its historical circumstances. And further, when reading scripture, genre needs to be taken into account. As Dr. Erica Moore, my Hebrew and Old Testament professor, would consistently reinforce that phrase, Context is key. It's appropriate in our interpretation of Scripture. The original meaning understood by its historical and cultural setting in relationship to the whole narrative. It provides proof of the inerrancy of Scripture. The importance of genre coupled with the historical and cultural context must not be overlooked. See, understanding context is key to guarding us for selecting a single verse with the attempt to prove and justify our own agendas that are inconsistent with the whole biblical narrative. And the fifth principle is to recognize that the narrative words and deeds are God speaking to us. God speaks to us in the human words inspired by the Holy Spirit and in the words of Jesus Christ. As Roy Blakely reminds us, bringing 
bringing the divine authorship of all scripture together without contradiction is one we must affirm. And the sixth imperative principle is, by his mighty power, the spirit takes the creative powerful words, deeds, and appearances of God as narrated in scripture and repeats them in life today as a foretaste of God's final victory. And this principle pulls us to consider the purpose of the gospel and its application for our lives today. Its focus is on the essence of the Bible's message, the way of salvation in Christ by grace through faith that is simple enough for humanity to grasp. It is through the Holy Spirit given to all believers that we embrace our salvation and the interpretation of scripture. God's grace that allows us to enter into a relationship based on Jesus, his cross and resurrection is cemented with his Holy Spirit who abides in us. Carl Barth provides an example of one who identifies the power of the Holy Spirit from his studies of Anselm. The Holy Spirit is the enabler of the hearer to know God who cannot be known except by the word Jesus Christ. And it is only by the Holy Spirit that humanity can dynamically receive, believe, and act upon the word. And the seventh guiding principle is knowing that the purpose of scripture is to bring us into a saving and growing relationship with the one true God. And scriptures to be read with that as the primary goal. This principle points us back to our creeds and our collective belief that we are forgiven of our sins and believe in our salvation of resurrection and life everlasting and are called into relationship with our Lord and Savior. Billy Graham puts it this way, being a Christian is more than just an instantaneous conversion. It is a daily process whereby you grow to be more and more like Christ. And we are not alone, which is our eighth principle, that we have an understanding that interpreting scripture is the work of the entire church and for that reason, it is important to study what others have thought about a particular passage. The Bible is not just a historical account of people, places, and events. It is God speaking to our hearts, our souls, and our minds. The same Holy Spirit who inspired the authors of the Bible is the same Holy Spirit who opens us up to hear God speak to us by his word. It was the early church inspired by the Holy Spirit, who canonized these writings into the Bible. It was the early church through Revelation who came to understand the triune God and the two, two fully and complete natures of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Rudolf Boltman, in his book, Kerygma and Myth, a theological debate says, it is not in the imagery of scripture that is significant for seekers, but rather in the understanding of existence to which the Bible enshrines, meaning the importance of the church. One key important and significant task is to keep the original teaching while discerning new revelation for the continuation and further enlightenment of the body. See, it would be arrogant to believe that we can do this individually. It is through our creeds and these interpretive principles that we have the triune framework for rightly interpreting scripture. It is through this understanding that we fully grasp the depth and breadth of, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have life eternal. The Bible is a unique book. I'm 
one second while I mute. The Bible is a unique book. It is an exhaustible spring in which to drink. And one of my favorite sayings is, scripture, there is no substitute. I often get the question, why is there a difference between a Protestant Bible and a Catholic Bible? What is the difference? So I just want to run through that. A Protestant Bible is the Christian Bible whose translation or revision was produced by Protestants. And we heard this earlier. Uh, our Bibles comprise of 39 books of the Old Testament, and that's according to the Jewish Hebrew Bible canon, and 27 books of the New Testament for a total of 66. And some Protestants use Bibles, which also include 14 additional books in a section known as the Apocrypha. And all of those, these books are not considered canonical. In fact, I have a, had a copy of the Apocrypha sitting on my desk here earlier. But although these are not considered canonical, um, they are considered inspired, and it could bring the total uh, to a number of, six, of uh, 80 books, be 66 plus the 14. Now I'm going to show you the Catholic Bible. <coughs> Excuse me. The Catholic Bible had um, uh, 73 books. All the 66 from the Protestant Bible, and as you can see here, seven of the Apocrypha that are considered within their canon of Scripture. And what I'm attempting to do is to show you by the highlighted red where these books fall within the sequence of how they would be listed within uh, the Catholic Bible. So as you see, Catholics have the same New Testament all of what we consider as the Old Testament with the seven of the Apocrypha books added in. And as a side note, it was Luther's Bible of 1534 that the Apocrypha was first published as a separate section. And we know that the Puritans used that standard of sola scriptura, scripture alone, to determine which books would be included in the canon, in the Protestant canon. The Westminster Confession of Faith, composed during the British Civil War of 1642 to 1651, excluded the books we now call the Apocrypha from the canon. And the confession provided the rationale for the exclusion, that these books that we now commonly call the Apocrypha were not of being divinely inspired and they have no part in the canon of scripture and therefore are of no authority in the church of God, nor to be any otherwise approved or made use of. So the Bible's printed by English Protestants who separated from the church of England began to exclude these books. But the practice of including only the 39 Old and 27 New Testament books within printed Bibles was standardized following an 1825 decision by the British and Foreign Bible Society. So you can, you can read several reasons why, um, from reducing cost of printed materials to not adding to the, uh, to the sufficiency of Scripture as reasons why they were left out. But know this, Anglican and Lutheran churches, denominations, still include the Apocrypha in our lectionaries. And today, uh, I've been seeing it in uh, the bookstore, Barnes & Noble, uh, English um, Protestant Bibles with the Apocrypha are becoming popular. However, the general ecumenical attitude affirms the Apocrypha writings as non-canonical, even when used as an appendix. Another question that I'm asked a lot is, what translation should I read? Should I read the King James or English Standard Version, the, you know, the ESV or, or the NIV? 
or am I okay reading the message? And I believe in my heart of heart is that you read the translation that holds your interest, that you enjoy reading, as you see in this chart that I've copied from Scott Duvall's book, it depends on what you're seeking and what you plan to use it for. For a more formal word-to-word -word translation, uh, for those of us who, who sit down and study the word and we look at the Greek, the Hebrew, the word, you're on the far left side, the more formal. At which times it may be hard to follow. And so if you're, if you're looking at to read something for uh, comprehension, to, to follow this love story, you may want to shift over to the right. But wherever the Holy Spirit is pulling you and drawing you and where you feel comfortable to what to read, you're reading God's love story. Use the version that fits best you. For ease of reading and flow of understanding, like I said, move towards the right. This is a love story. Whatever leads you to find Jesus Christ, that's the translation you want. Because at the heart, the Bible is a book about Christ. Remember back when Jesus appeared to some of his disciples after he rose from the dead and they were on the road to Emmaus? And Jesus said to them, O oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets had spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them all of the scriptures, the things concerning himself. Read whatever version pulls you closer to Christ. The Old Testament is a book of promise. In multiple rich ways, it anticipates the coming of Jesus Christ, starting, and then starting with the four Gospels, the New Testament is the story of Jesus and conveys what he came to accomplish. As John's Gospel says, Jesus came to reveal God to us. In John 1, no one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side, Jesus. He has made him the Father known. So going back to our eight interpretive principles, an important question that should always be asked in Bible reading and in Bible study is, what does this passage tell me about Christ? And when you start doing that, my friend, Clint Arnold gives this warning. He says, Bible study is addictive. Once you begin reading and learning, you will find deep delight in it and you'll want more. And that, my friend, is a good thing. So in closing, I wanna leave you with this. The greatest love story ever told is found within the biblical story of God's unfolding plan to redeem all creation. The Bible is a unified, coherent narrative of God's ongoing work. After God created the world and human rebellion marred it, God set out to restore what he had made. God did not turn his back on a world bent on destruction. He turned his face toward it in love. He set out on the long road of redemption to restore the lost as his people and the world as his kingdom. And that's a quote from the Christian Reformed Church. See, the Bible is not a mere jumble of history. It's not just thrown together poetry, lessons in morality and theology, comforting promises, guiding principles and commands. Instead, it is fundamentally coherent. Every part of the Bible, each event, book, character, command, prophecy, and poem, and it must be understood in the context of the one storyline. Many of us, I'm guilty of this. I've read the Bible as if it were merely a mosaic of little bits. And that's how I started. Read a little bit here, read a little bit there. Historical, critical, sermons, devotional, little things. 
But when we read the Bible in such a fragmented way, I, it, it ignores its divine authority and this intention to shape our lives through its story. It is a complete coherent story that we must grasp and read that love letter from beginning to end, to understand it from beginning to end. This love story includes two important emphasis. The first, the, the, the comprehensive scope of God's redemptive work in creation. The biblical story does not move toward the destruction of the world and our own rescue to heaven. Instead, it all comes to head in the restoration of the entire creation to its original goodness. The comprehensive scope of creation, sin, and redemption is evident throughout the Bible. That's the first emphasis. And the second is each one of us, every believer has their own place within the story. You know, some refer to the four questions as foundational to a biblical worldview of who am I? Where am I? What's wrong? What's the solution? N.T. Wright adds an important fifth question. What time is it? The question that we have to ask ourselves is when we understand the story and God's love for us is how does his love shape our lives in the present? How are we changed? And for that, we can all say, thanks be to God. Uh, Father, we do thank you for your love story. You've given it to us. We ask that question knowing as your believers, your children, followers of your son, our Lord Jesus Christ, that it does make an impact. And we thank you for that transformational power of your Holy Spirit within each and every one of our lives where we can come to you and cry, Abba, Father, to have relationship with you through your son. In his name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Randy. It's amazing and inspiring. And uh, so I am Paige Brimble. I'm the connection coordinator and I'm here to connect us together as we discuss this uh, incredible love story that God has given us. Um, so if you have a question, if you can wait, raise your hand or you're welcome to go down at the bottom of your screen and enter it into the chat um, and we can raise some questions for Randy or anyone else um, you'd like to address. I got a question. Sure. Randy, thank, thank you for, for that. Uh, a concept I've come across, and I don't know if it's the actual title of a book or not, refers to praying the Bible. And, uh, and it's a concept that I've uh, become aware of. It's not a discipline that I've ever tried to follow. But could you, could you talk about that? As Absolutely. Well? Absolutely. Pray, praying the Bible. Okay. Our prayer life with our reading, our discipline of reading the scripture. Sure. So, so as we know um, that the Holy Spirit uh, inspired the writers it's the Holy Spirit who in, who illuminates we use that that term it's the Holy Spirit uh, who illuminates scripture to us and so if you if you sit down and just pick up your Bible and read like like you're reading any other book are you making that opportunity are you reaching out are you connecting are you co in communion with the divine with the Almighty God mm -hmm to allow that illumination to take place. So praying the Bible is getting yourself postured, prepared for reading God's word. You pray into that moment. So my study time when I wake up is I open up my Bible and, and you go into a moment of, of uh, prayer, reflection, meditation before I read. 
So, and then after you read a passage, and if there's anything that is, that you're not sure of, you pray into that and you seek, you're praying that scripture for understanding. There is one meaning behind every, so this is, this is interesting. There's, there's one meaning in, in God's word. There's one meaning for a passage. The application takes on many, uh, uh, there are different applications depending on the individual. One meaning, many applications. Mm -hmm. Okay, awesome. Thank Lee, you. did that answer your question? Yes, it did, thank you. So we have a question from the chat. It says, do you know, this is from Ann, you know, on a high level, the difference in sh the scripture used by Latter-day Saints. Oh, yes, the Mormons. Um, I do have a Mormon Bible, um, and I also have a, um, uh, who's the uh, watchtower? Uh, Jehovah, Jehovah Witness. Witnesses. Yeah, I, I have Jehovah Witness, and I have a, uh, and I have a, a Mormon Bible. So, um, the Mormons have a very simple, you know, they have a Protestant Bible, then the Book of Mormon is... Um, they have writings now that go beyond what the early church considered um, canonized scripture, that, that the Holy Spirit, no longer is there additional scripture needed. The sufficiency of the Bible is complete in the 66 books that we currently have. The Mormons now have additional writings that extend into uh, the 19th century. And so those are writings that are captured within their uh, Book of Mormon. It's, a, it's an addition to a Bible. So they have the main Bible, a second um, secondary Bible, or they, it's, it's not secondary in authority to them, but it's canonized scripture that has God's word has continued and is captured in the Book of Mormon. And they also have the uh, Pearl of Gate, um, the Pearl of Great Price. I, I'd have to go to my library and pull those books off the shelf, but that's what I know, yeah. Ann. Randy, is that also connected to the um, the Book of Mormon to the the prophecy of, of Joseph Smith? Yeah, jo Joseph Smith, who received the gold tablets. That um, of course, theirs is the only denomination that has been given authority by John the Baptist for baptism, which is why they pray for all the dead. Um, yeah. Okay. Great. <laughs> um, yeah, that goes back to what we were saying. Of, um, it would be arrogant if we thought we were the only ones. Next question. She also said, adds to th a thank you and says the gospel that they confess seems to be salvation by the death of Jesus on the cross. Yeah, their, uh, their, their belief in, I'm, I'm trying to get to Ann's question so I can see it. One can you see it? Yeah. yeah. I think, yeah, that's. Okay, thanks. Thanks. The gospel that they confess seems to be salvation by the death of Jesus on the cross. Um, I don't, I'm, I'm not, I don't know that. I'm not, I can't respond to that. Sorry, Ann. <laughs> I can't either. Yeah. No, I, uh, my, I, I had a, uh, had a close friend of mine who was a Mormon. Yes. You talking about the Mormons? Yes. Mm -hmm. so the Mormons are work, salvation by work, um, by deeds, by works, not saved by grace. Um, and of course, you know, if you study what the Mormons believe, if all goes well, you will have your own planet one day um, to rule over. And you'll have um, the people of that planet, especially the females, to populate that planet. Um, but they don't necessarily believe that salvation comes through the blood of Christ. Uh, Jesus was more um, a, a brother, an equal, um, so to speak, an example of how to live, um, but, but not salvation through Christ alone. Anyhow, that's what I know uh, 
without getting into more detail about the Mormons. Thank you, Rich. Thank you so much. So on the, also on the chat, we have a question from David that says, what was your point about interpreting scripture through the creeds? Uh, the creeds always set boundaries for us. So the whole point of the creeds is they put things, have you ever noticed where the creeds are placed within our liturgy? Our creeds are always placed right after the sermon so that no matter what the preacher preaches on, <laughs> the creed puts everything back in bounds. Yeah, think about that. Always see where the creed falls. It always falls right after the sermon. And it's placed there by our church fathers, by those who, who would say, and so that's what the creeds are for, is they are like, it's kind of like bowling. You have gutters on both sides, and that ball is not going to jump over into some other person's lane. Or you can look at it as being a, a fence in a, in a ballpark. It is going to contain your belief, your scripture. That is, that's why we say, let us proclaim our faith in the words of either the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, because that is the framework that bounds us. Every, all scripture is bounded within the creeds. Um, and that was from David. That, that yes. was my point. That was from David. Yeah. Um, so, Randy, are there other Christian creeds that um, were written, but they don't carry the same um, authority as the Nicene Creed in the Apocalypse? There is, yeah, in our historical documents, uh, there is another creed. It's a much longer one. Yeah, the Nation Creed. Yeah. Okay. Yes. And that, okay. that would be the third one. And so um, it's, you know, I don't think it's in our Anglican. Is it in the Anglican prayer book? I haven't, I haven't looked for it. I know it was in the, uh, in the Episcopal prayer book. That's a good question. I'll take that for action. I, I need to, I need to okay. see if that creed is in there. Thank you. For, I, who, who has I that have question? one behind me. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think one of the differences between the Apostles Creed, the Nicene Creed and the Athanasian Creed is the Athanasian Creed includes condemnations of those who do not believe in the Nicene Creed. Mm. Um, and so uh, those that disagree or are in disagreement with the Nicene Creed, the Athanasian Creed addresses those through condemnation. Okay. Thank you. Awesome. Um, anyone else? Any hands raising? If not, let's get a teaser from David Booman for next week. Thank you, Randy. And next week, we are going to be uh, looking at healing. We're going to be looking at the God who heals. Um, I can see some prayer ministers uh, out there. And so uh, this will be right up your alley. Um, we'll be looking at... Uh, the character of God. We'll be looking at the heart of God. You know, so what is His nature, with uh, regards to um, you know the suffering and the brokenness of His world? How does He? What is His nature as He interacts with the world? What is His uh, heart towards the world? And then, um, <clears throat> as Christians, um, what is the posture? the biblical posture that we see in scripture for uh, receiving healing. Yes. Um, Jesus has a lot to say about um, how to receive healing. And so we're going to be um, kind of taking a, a deeper dive in a <clears throat> very practical way um, into uh, um, the theology mm -hmm. of, of healing. Um, and if, if anybody has any questions <laughs> uh, to prime the pump tonight, be uh, be happy to. Oh to no! We're, we're, we're going to save that for next week, David. We're going <laughs> to save that for next week. Hey, I did find I did find the Athanasian Creed in our brand, in our new hymn, in our new uh, prayer book. Fantastic! Good. Anglican so it's, prayer it's book. part yeah, of our back. it's part of our historical documents, and yeah. they belong to the Anglican Church, and we are Anglicans. Thank you for that. Um, Paige Grimble, thank you so much for, uh, for hosting our, uh, our questions and answer session. Uh, thank you all for attending. 
Uh, this Sunday, um, our theme is the cost of discipleship. Mm. The cost of mm. being a disciple. So Thank join you. us on Sunday for that. And it's also part of our Sunday school since we do preach and teach off the Gospel Project. So the Adult Sunday School meets at 9.15 on Sunday on Zoom. Uh, find us in our uh, e-blast email that comes out. Uh, that's 9.15 on Sunday morning, and then we go right into the church service, uh, and you can watch that on YouTube. So again, that is the cost of discipleship. Let us pray. Uh, Father, we do thank you uh, again for this, for this night, for this uh, time that we come together. You are almighty, worthy of all worship, and you call us to be your disciples. So Father, as we go into this coming Sunday, where we know the theme is the cost of discipleship, lay on our hearts your call, the purpose that you would have for us. What are you asking? What, what are you calling us to do? And where have we fallen short? And where do we need to repent? Where do we turn to you for forgiveness and seek to get back on the right path? Open our ears to let us hear. And Father, send us forth to do your will, that we may delight in it, and that we may walk in your ways and bring you glory. In your son's name we pray. Amen. 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 Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Don't get up. You have to stay on. <laughs> Why am I so tall and you're so short? <laughs> we saw another thing today. We have one more thing. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize you knew so much about uh, the Mormons, Rich. You had uh, interactions with them? Many of them. Really? I don't think I've ever talked to one. Um, the Mormons are very involved with the Boy Scouts of America. Mm. No kidding. You know, I yes, actually, they are. I they actually have, went to a couple of, uh, I went to a ward a few times. They wear secret underwear. No. <laughs> they do. I never, I, I never found that to be, to be the, to be so, uh, with them. Um, yeah, my, my cousin was really high up in the Boy Scouts and, uh, they're all, they're all Mormons and the yeah. kids to bring them young and, all that. Yeah, they were really nice people. Uh, I yeah, really like they like their a, construct of heaven. You know, they, they have do the, a lot of service, and they're they are they're they do a lot of service and helps. Um, but it's just very work oriented for salvation. the The main point is Jesus is kind of the first child of God, and then we're the children of God. But they put us on a equal. <clears throat> playing field with Christ. They don't put Christ as deity. He's you more sure you're not talking Jehovah Witness. No, that's the Mormons. Um, Jehovah's Witness, we can go down a whole nother trail with them. <laughs> you seen Book of Mormon? I haven't seen it, but I heard it. They all get naked at the end, Paige. Is <laughs> that's that what the you're craziest talking about? Thing. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, anyway. Yeah, I, my, my roommate in college was uh, Mormon, so he would take, so I, I had like, well, I had four different roommates across the time. I had my Catholic uh, roommate is, uh, took me uh, to his service where Father Sam from the Citadel told me I could not take communion, and then uh, uh, Carl Weitz would take me to the, uh, to the ward, the Mormon church, the ward. And like I said, I love that concept of heaven without really having a hell. That's the subterrestrial level, terrestrial level, celestial level. And at the subterrestrial level, which is their hell, it just means separation from God. Isn't that so cool? It's like there's not really any true pain and punishment. It's just separation from God. But then again, that would be pain and punishment. Yeah. I was um, surprised by the <clears throat> Boltman quote. Oh, you were? Why? Yeah, the, the father of liberalism. 
Oh, come on. The father of theological liberalism. <laughs> no. <clears throat> yeah, that's, that's his title. <laughs> and we're still recording. We're still recording. It's we're still we recording. I need to. I need to stop that.